يوم الخير بسم الله Dubai again. Yes, there was a storm in Dubai, and even worse, there was snow. This makes Dubai residents both happy and scared. A terrible storm has just consumed Dubai. What occurred? Is that a natural disaster or a sign of the end times? In this episode, I will explain in more detail. Smash that thumbs up button for me, leave me a comment down below, and share this video with your friends. And let's get started. In recent days, Dubai has been hit by a powerful storm, causing chaos and confusion across the vibrant city. Strong gusts of wind, along with heavy rain and a sandstorm, created terrifying scenes, causing high-rise buildings to gradually disappear in a thick layer of sand fog. In the city centre, the streets that were always bustling with people are now empty, leaving only the cold wind blowing. Luxury restaurants and high-end stores had to close, and large stores could not avoid the impacts of this fierce storm. The city's public transport and road systems also face many difficulties, with many roads flooded and traffic jams. Police and rescuers had to operate in difficult conditions to help people who were trapped or in danger. In the sky, planes had to cancel or divert their routes to avoid encountering this powerful storm. People living in coastal areas or vulnerable residential areas must evacuate and find safe shelter. In a city where it is often hot and dry, the white snow falls like a nightmare, covering high-rise buildings and vibrant shopping areas. Famous buildings and structures such as Burj Khalifa and Palm Jumeirah are covered with a layer of fine white snow, creating a strange scene like in a fairy tale. The city streets turned into a cold maze of snow, as thick layers of snow covered everywhere. Vehicles had difficulty moving in slippery conditions, and many roads had to be closed due to the danger. Police and rescue forces must assist people in traveling and provide necessary help. People in Dubai, not used to such a cold climate, had to find ways to protect themselves from this sudden cold by wearing warm clothes and finding safe shelter. Shops and restaurants are open to provide warmth and protection to people, while authorities also urge people to be vigilant and proactive in dealing with the situation. The sky was full of dark clouds rolling over the city, seemingly a sign of an impending change in weather. Suddenly, from above, huge stones began to fall from the sky, 
creating rattling noises and strong gusts of wind. The city's high-rise buildings and unique architectural structures became vulnerable to the force of the hail, with many glass windows shattered, roof sections destroyed, and wounds still left on the walls. Panic-stricken residents and tourists in Dubai sought safe shelter, with many rushing into shops, restaurants or undercover to avoid potentially dangerous large stones. Vehicles had to stop or move very slowly on the road, with many road sections blocked by large stones on the road, causing delays and hindering the movement of people. Natural disasters such as hurricanes, blizzards and hail can have serious environmental and social consequences. Casualties, physical damage and economic loss are inevitable, along with environmental loss and psychological and social consequences. Community support and cooperation are needed to cope with and recover from the event. The special thing here is that after a snowstorm, the sky gradually darkens, revealing the moon. It's actually a blood moon. A blood moon happens when Earth's moon is in a total lunar eclipse. While it has no special astronomical significance, the view in the sky is striking as the usually whitish moon becomes red or ruddy brown. Lunar eclipses can only happen during a full moon when the sun fully illuminates the surface. Usually, a full moon has no eclipse because the moon orbits in a slightly different plane than the Earth and the sun. However, at times the planes coincide. Earth passes in between the moon and the sun and cuts off the sunlight, causing an eclipse. The blood moon is not only a beautiful astronomical phenomenon, but also carries a deep and spiritual meaning in many religious beliefs and cultural traditions. In various faiths, the blood moon is often considered a sign of judgment and the end of times. According to many scriptures and prophetic books, the blood moon is described as part of the prophecies of the end times, when the world prepares to face the return of God and His judgment. In these prophecies, the blood moon is often placed in the context of major events, such as the great doom or the resurrection of God. For many people, observing the blood moon after a snowstorm can awaken spiritual beliefs and thoughts about the deeper meaning of life and existence. It can be seen as an expression of the union between nature and spirituality, making those who witness it feel a thrill and a clear sense of something beyond the limits of the world material. At the same time, it can also promote faith and hope in believers, awakening them to face the meaning of life and the future. If Earth partially blocks the sun and the darkest part of its shadow falls across the moon's surface, it is called a partial eclipse. You will see a black shadow taking a bite out of the moon. Sometimes, the moon passes through the lighter part of Earth's shadow, causing a penumbral eclipse. Only seasoned sky watchers will be able to tell the difference because the moon only darkens very slightly. During a full eclipse, however, something spectacular happens. The moon is fully in Earth's shadow. At the same time, a little bit of light from Earth's sunrises and sunsets on the disk of the planet falls on the surface of the moon. Because the light waves are stretched out, they look red. When this red light strikes the moon's surface, it also appears red. How red the moon appears can depend on how much pollution, cloud cover, or debris there is in the atmosphere. For example, if an eclipse takes place shortly after a volcanic eruption, the particles in the atmosphere will make the moon look darker than usual. While there are planets and moons all over the solar system, only Earth is lucky enough to experience lunar eclipses because its shadow is just large enough to cover the moon completely. The moon is slowly drifting away from our planet at roughly 1.6 inches or 4 centimeters a year, and this situation won't persist forever. 
There are roughly two to four lunar eclipses every year, according to NASA, and each one is visible over about half the Earth. When a neighbor across the street yelled, Come over, we're going in the storm cellar. So Wade, his wife and three-year-old son, joined ten other people and seven dogs in the crowded underground shelter. When they came out, their homes were gone. Nothing was left but the foundations. If we hadn't gone to that cellar, I don't know if we would be here, Wade said, NPR. Early warning systems, discerning the signs. This is just one example of how recognizing and heeding warnings can protect us from the perilous power of the air. From biblical times, humans have stood in awe of the atmospheric forces that have unleashed deadly storms. The wisdom of the ancients included some understanding of the signs that preceded wild weather. In modern times, the devastation caused by tornadoes, hurricanes and other storms has motivated meteorologists to constantly improve their knowledge and tools to better predict storms. In 1986, the US National Weather Service issued warnings before 25% of tornadoes, with an average lead time of about 5 minutes. Now the lead time has increased to around 13 minutes and 75% of tornadoes are predicted. To set up an effective early warning system to save lives from natural disasters, you must know the key signs of impending danger and have continuous surveillance. The same is true for monitoring man-made dangers in today's world. What are the key signs we should constantly be watching so we can be aware of the times in which we live? and be prepared for what's coming. Biblical indicators for discerning the signs of the times. Jesus chided the religious leaders of his day for not recognizing the biblical signs of the momentous times they were living in. The Pharisees and Sadducees were testing Jesus, asking him to show them a sign or miracle from heaven. In reply, Jesus contrasted their knowledge of the weather with their understanding of prophecy. When it is evening, you say, it will be fair weather, for the sky is red. And in the morning, it will be foul weather today, for the sky is red and threatening. Hypocrites, you know how to discern the face of the sky, but you cannot discern the signs of the times. Matthew 16, 2, 3. Cause and effect and Bible prophecy. A key biblical principle is cause and effect, that we reap what we sow. Many passages highlight this overarching truth that obeying God brings blessings, but disobeying His beneficial laws automatically brings curses. For example, Deuteronomy 28 introduces a list of blessings with their cause. If you diligently obey the voice of the Lord your God to observe carefully all His commandments, all these blessings shall come upon you. Verses 1-2 but verse 15 begins a list of the negative effects of disobedience. But it shall come to pass if you do not obey the voice of the Lord your God to observe carefully all his commandments and his statutes which I command you today, that all these curses will come upon you and overtake you. Reading through this list of curses is a crash course in understanding the signs of the times. Increasing disobedience to God's commandments is a sign of trouble to come as in the days of Noah. One powerful example of cause and effect occurred in the time of Noah. The book of Genesis makes clear that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Genesis 6, 5. The world then was filled with violence as humans corrupted themselves and God's creation. Verse 11. This disobedience to God's beneficial laws caused automatic pain and suffering to the point that God was grieved in his heart and decided to start all over again through Noah and his family. Verses 6, 18. Even though, from God's perspective, the storm clouds of the impending flood were obvious, the people of Noah's day ignored Noah's warnings and lived as if nothing were wrong. Jesus Christ made this point in his warning to people about the signs of the end time. For as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered the ark, and did not know until the flood came and took them all away, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. Matthew 24, 38. 
39. Like the proverbial frog in the pot that didn't notice the increasing temperature, we can easily become inured to the increasing sin beginning to boil around us. Year after year, human opinions about sin have changed. Actions recognized as wrong in the past are increasingly accepted, whether premarital sex, cheating, lying, swearing, lusting, or homosexual sex. Jesus warned that we must not fall prey to the apathy of Noah's day. Signs of the End Times Jesus defined the end times as the period when human survival would again be on the line. Matthew 24, 21, 22 Watch and pray. At the end of this Olivet prophecy, Jesus said, But take heed to yourselves, lest your hearts be weighed down with carousing, drunkenness, and cares of this life, and that day come on you unexpectedly. Watch, therefore, and pray always that you may be counted worthy to escape all these things that will come to pass, and to stand before the Son of Man. Luke 21, 34, 36. So we are to watch not only the signs of the times in world events, but the signs of our own spiritual state. We must not be blinded by our daily cares. We need the vision to see ourselves as God sees us, to see the urgent need to repent, change, and prepare for Jesus Christ's return. In what is called the Olivet Prophecy, Jesus said, For then there will be great tribulation, such as has not been since the beginning of the world until this time, no, nor ever shall be. And unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved, meaning alive. But for the elect's sake, those days will be shortened. Matthew 24, 21, 22. What will happen to Christians during the Great Tribulation? The popular teaching today is that they will be raptured to heaven before the Great Tribulation begins and return with Christ at his second, coming to end the Great Tribulation, and to put Satan away. What is the correct biblical teaching on what will happen to Christians during the tribulation? In Jesus' prophecy to the seven churches, which was given to John for him to write in the book of Revelation, Jesus said, Because you have kept my command to persevere, I also will keep you from the hour of trial which shall come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. Revelation 3.10 the hour of trial that will come on the whole world is the Great Tribulation. These Christians will be protected from the Great Tribulation because they kept Christ's command to persevere, and they also kept the commandments of God, Revelation 14.12. But how and where will they be kept from that hour of trial? A woman flies into the wilderness. In chapter 12 of the book of Revelation, John writes of a war in heaven between Satan and the archangel Michael, but Satan will lose and be cast back down to the earth. Satan will then have great wrath because he knows he has but a short time left. He will bring about great tribulation, war, and persecute the woman, which at the end of the chapter is symbolic of Christ's church, verses 12, 13. Verse 14 says, but the woman was given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness to her place where she is nourished for a time and times and half a time from the presence of the serpent, Satan. Notice that the woman, here meaning the church, will fly into the wilderness to her place. The word place is singular. This verse also says the church is nourished for three and a half years, time equal sign one year, times equal sign two years, half a time equal sign half a year, in the wilderness. See also Revelation 13, 5. Does the Bible indicate any possible location for this wilderness or place of safety? Some have speculated about where a place of safety would be, such as Petra in Jordan, but the Bible does not clearly indicate a specific location. We do know that part of the church will be taken into a wilderness to her place, Revelation 12, 14, where it will be nourished, protected, and cared for. The wording implies there is one location that will be prepared at which the church will be protected, but Scripture does not clearly identify that place. Are all protected in a place of safety? But will all Christians be included? 
Although some Christians will be nourished and protected, it seems others will suffer persecution and martyrdom during the time of the Great Tribulation. Revelation 6, 9, 11. Revelation 12, 17. Speaking of the time of his second coming, Jesus said, And he will send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they will gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven, atmosphere, to the other. Matthew 24, 31. When Christ returns, he will resurrect faithful saints from their graves, and the saints who are alive will be changed into spirit. The saints who are alive will have lived through the great tribulation. Will they have been protected in a particular location or place of safety? Revelation 7 describes a group of people numbering 144,000, verses 3, 4, and also a great multitude which no one could number, verse 9, that is said to have come out of the great tribulation, verse 14. The Bible does not say whether these people will be in a wilderness location during the last part of the great tribulation or whether they will be taken to such a location after they are sealed for protection. Exactly how and where they are protected is not revealed. God protects his people. The book of Psalms contains numerous scriptures that speak of God protecting his faithful people. In these passages, the focus is on trusting God, as opposed to being in a specific location in order to be protected. Psalm 18, 2. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my strength in whom I will trust, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. Psalm 27, 5. For in the time of trouble he shall hide me in his pavilion, in the secret place of his tabernacle he shall hide me, he shall set me high upon a rock. Psalm 31, 20. You shall hide them in the secret place of your presence from the plots of man. You shall keep them secretly in a pavilion, shelter, revised standard version, from the strife of tongues. Psalm 32, 7. You are my hiding place. You shall preserve me from trouble. Psalm 91, 7, 9, 10. A thousand may fall at your side and ten thousand at your right hand, but it shall not come near you, because you have made the Lord, who is my refuge, even the Most High, your dwelling place. No evil shall befall you, nor shall any plague come near your dwelling. Psalm 121, 7. The Lord shall preserve you from all evil. He shall preserve your soul. These promises of protection will be fulfilled for the woman who flies into the wilderness, for those who come out of great tribulation, and for those gathered alive at Christ's return from the four winds of the earth. The one common thread in all of these scripture examples is that God will protect those who faithfully seek to serve, obey, and trust in him. Place of safety summary. What can we conclude from these scriptures in reference to a place of safety? The Bible says, some Christians will go into the wilderness to be protected from Satan and his wrath, Revelation 12, 14. The Bible also says some Christians will not go into this wilderness, place of safety, and Satan will go to make war with them, Revelation 12, 17. The Bible also shows that many other servants of God will be sealed for protection, Revelation 7, 3, 8. Several Psalms speak of the Lord's protection of his faithful saints. Jesus' instructions to Christians today. The place of safety may be an intriguing subject to study, but it is not what Jesus wanted Christians to be constantly dwelling on. It is true, he instructed us to watch therefore and pray always that you may be counted worthy to escape all these things that will come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. Luke 21:36. But worrying about one's personal safety to the exclusion of other important spiritual responsibilities is not what Christ had in mind. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus instructed us to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you, Matthew 6.33. If Christians are seeking first God's kingdom and his righteousness, 
Then they will be watching and praying, and Jesus will be with them always, even to the end of the age. Matthew 28, 20. The popular narrative often shows a collapsed civilization. The planet has become a wasteland of crumbled buildings and motionless cars. Millions of bodies are scattered about. Radios and televisions are silent. The power grid is gone and all appears dark. But then, like Noah and his family stepping off the ark, a few survivors who took refuge in underground shelters slowly make their way to the surface to rebuild the earth. As they stumble through the smoke and rubble, they begin to gather in small groups, searching for meaning in their now shattered world. Post-apocalyptic fiction, novels and films with such doomsday scenarios abound. When most people hear the word apocalypse, it engenders an immediate association with great devastation on the earth that leaves only a remnant of survivors to carry on the human race. Stories about the end of the world have fascinated people throughout human history, and today, science fiction movie theatrics can create the vivid imagery of nuclear explosions and leveled cities, catastrophic loss of human life and zombies roaming the streets in the aftermath. Religious apocalypse? or meaningless apocalypse. Author Daniel Wojcik wrote, Until recently, the end of the world has been interpreted as a meaningful, transformative, and supernatural event involving the annihilation and renewal of the earth by deities or divine forces. During the last half of the 20th century, however, widespread beliefs about a meaningless apocalypse have emerged and now compete with traditional religious apocalyptic worldviews end of the world as we know it, faith, fatalism, and apocalypse in America, PI1. In other words, a more contemporary use of the word apocalypse describes meaningless mass destruction, the age of potential annihilation. Over the past 60 years or so, interest in the end of the world has dramatically increased. But why such a fascination with the destruction of society? According to Wojcik, the creation and proliferation of nuclear weapons in particular have fundamentally altered contemporary apocalyptic thought, fueling fears of global annihilation and evoking widespread fatalism about the future of humanity. P1. The dropping of atomic bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, Japan, in August of 1945, helped promote the idea that civilization as we know it could end by an apocalyptic disaster. This fairly universal human concern is one major reason for the popularity of apocalyptic movies and novels. Added to that, scientific research is often dramatized by media portrayals of other risks to humankind. These include the gradual destruction of the environment, megastorms, volcanic eruptions, solar storms, global ozone depletion, widespread famine and incurable strains of diseases. These are real concerns, but they also help feed fatalistic fears that the world might end by one or more of these causes. Apocalypse etymology, it originally meant revelation. Though the word apocalypse has come to have doomsday overtones, it's interesting to note what it originally meant. According to Dictionary.com, comma, the English word apocalypse comes from the Greek word apocalypsis, which simply means revelation and is equivalent to apocalyptian, meaning to uncover, reveal. In religious contexts, it is usually a disclosure of something hidden, like knowledge or understanding. In the Bible, the Greek word apocalypsis refers to the book of Revelation, which was given to the Apostle John. The book of Revelation is Jesus Christ's unveiling of events to his servants, Revelation 1.1. What is revealed is a series of major events that lead to the end of this present age, including Christ's return to the earth. In the great white throne judgment, God will judge those who do not put faith in him. He will resurrect all unbelievers, and they will be thrown into the lake of fire along with Satan, the Antichrist, and the false prophet. How to be ready for the second coming. The second coming of the Lord will occur at the end of the Great Tribulation. We can be ready for the second coming of Christ by ensuring that we have placed our trust in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. If we have done this, then we are ready for the second coming of Jesus. 
We can also be prepared by living our lives for the Lord, by actively reading the Bible, praying, and participating in fellowship with other believers. Thank you for watching, and stay tuned for the next video.